Good morning, church. Thank you for joining with us again today. Uh, good news. Church will reopen next Sunday on June 13th. As of June 7th, uh, the island of Montreal will be uh, considered an orange zone. And so that means that we can meet with up to 100 people in our building, still practicing social distancing and, and wearing masks and following all those protocols. But, but we can finally come back together again. I mean, we had that one service in Easter, uh, at Easter, but basically it's been a year. It's been a year without meeting. And so this is going to be a great time. So I look forward to seeing you all once again. Um, so this video will be the last, I hope, for a long time, in, at least done in this way. We will continue to provide social media coverage of our services and, and have that online presence um, to reach as many as we can. But uh, we're, we're oh, just we're so excited to get back together. And this uh, series about meaningful relationships, you know, it, it, it has to be practiced. It has to be carried out. And so I look forward to applying all that we've learned together and not just inside of our services, but inside of our endeavors as well to reach those um, around us. And so uh, this is great news. And so I look forward to seeing you all next Sunday, uh, 1030 uh, at 501 Fifth Avenue Verdun. And we're going to uh, be church and do church and meet with God. It's going to be a great, great morning. So let's continue our series on meaningful relationships. And this morning, our text is found in Matthew chapter 7. Just one verse, verse 21. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. As a youth in church, I remember we questioned all the time about, you know, what, how do you get into heaven? What do you have to do? And, and what do you have to not do? Um, that was the constant sort of, uh, I won't call it an obsession, but it seemed that the discussions always came back to that. I don't know if it's just because as a, a teenager, you're testing the waters, but that was a very common theme. And, and, you know, perhaps it extends onto our adult years as well. You know, we make mistakes, we fall short. And we wonder if we've done that unpardonable, unpardonable sin. But here Jesus is as clear as clear can be, as in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. So practical, so down to earth. And he says, listen, this is who gets into the kingdom of heaven only. Only, only is a big word. Only the one who does the will of the Father. So doing God's will is paramount. It, it's the only thing that matters. And so I think we should know how to do this. I think we should know what it is and how to find it in our lives. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, I don't know what the will of God is for my life. So hopefully this morning, we'll, we'll, if that applies to any of us, that that will push us in the right direction. And really, I, I have on my heart sort of three um, aspects of the will of God or three applications of the will of God that we can do, that we can do daily in our lives. And, and this will help us uh, continue to perform the will of God or, or even find the will of God for our lives, I believe. And so let's uh, look at that this morning. Number one, I think we see Jesus showing uh, through his own pattern that the will of God has to be a priority. Now that sounds simple to say, and even sounds a little bit like, duh. But look at the way he did it. Look to at what extent, or to what extent, he did this. In John chapter 4, verse 34, it says, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me, and to complete his work. He equates um, the importance of doing the will of God to the importance of eating. And no jokes here, but food is important to all of us. 
We love food, most of us. We love eating. Some of us go to the extent of finding new recipes, watching videos, sharing Instagram photos about our food. Like, like food is, is huge, and so it should be, right? I mean, it's, it's what keeps us alive in part. And so Jesus here is saying, listen, knowing the will of God is as important and actually more important than food. And he goes to the extent to say that doing the will of God gives him nourishment. And so that's astounding. That's, that's a tremendous teaching. And that's sort of a wake-up call to us. That he expects us to pursue the will of God as much as we pursue food. And secondly, in this aspect of having the will of God a priority in our life, in the Garden of Gethsemane, on the night he was betrayed and was about to be arrested, and he knew what was coming, he prayed and he said, Lord, if you can take this cup from my hand, that, that would be great. And, and the cup, by the cup, he means the cross. But he, he ends this prayer by saying, but nonetheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. And we quote this all the time. We, we put it on our prayers and we throw it in there. And I mean, I'm not judging that practice, but let's be honest, the, the contexts of how we use it and how he used it are very different. We use it as uh, uh, um, part of our asking for things. He used it as a final declaration that he was submitting not just his will, but his very life to the Father. And so not only was the will of the Father more important than food to Jesus, the will of God was more important than his very life. <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that because I know I'm very far from being at that same place of prioritizing the will of God. But I trust that God will, will, will bring us there and that will, he'll move us there. The second thing I want to look at is how uh, the will of God is designed or is meant to be practiced daily. In Romans 12 verse 2, uh, the Apostle Paul is, is teaching on the will of God. And he says, Do not be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may test and approve what is the will of God, what is good and well-pleasing and perfect. We will be shaped by what we do every day. And we, be, we will be shaped in one of two ways. It's defined here. It's, it's outlined here. It's, it's explained here. We will be shaped. We will be formed. We will be fashioned by the world. Or we will be fashioned by doing the will of God. We will be modeled. We will be manipulated. We will be uh, twisted and, 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 and bent and so that's just a fact of life. We can't just stay in our comfort zone because even when we do that, we're still being shaped. We're being shaped by the world. We're being shaped by just who we want to keep being. And Paul here says, no, 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 don't do this. Don't settle into this place of letting the, the, the trends of the, de of the time. Don't be lulled into the place of letting the culture dictate how you will be, but instead be renewed. And this is a great word. This is like having uh, renovations done. This is like putting uh, a, a new kitchen in. This is like finally changing the bathtub. This is like finally getting the, the, the new toilet, you know? This is having like new things come in. And so it's not staying the same. It's not just resisting the world. It's not just fighting the, the, the temptations or, or the, uh, the times. This is like, as I don't do that, I get renewed. And I do it, I get this renovation done by transforming, it's a metamorphosis, by transforming my mind. I love that. 
Now, there's a, a, a cool little preposition here, and different Bible translations, you know, translate it differently. Um, this one said, uh, so that. But, I mean, that's good. That's a good translation. But the preposition means to be brought to the place, to be brought to the degree of, to be brought into the, 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 uh, the ability to do what's following, to test and approve what the will of God is, to test and approve. There it is. We have to practice the will of God. Now, maybe some of us don't like the word practice because it sounds, you know, just commonplace. But it's, it's a discipline. Like if I discipline myself, if I practice a, an instrument or my, my, my occupation or a sport, this is what it means. We are not called to read the will of God out of the sky. We're not called to uncover the will of God in, in a moment of meditation. Now, I'm not saying that we can't pray and we can't meditate and we can't reflect. I'm not saying that. But we're called to um, test the will of God. We're called to approve the will of God. And, and that word in the Greek means test. It means to scrutinize. It means to examine it means to put into the place of, of operation to see if it works. And that's how we know the will of God in our lives. Like we have to test it out, which means we have to be willing to make a mistake. It means that we have to be willing to try something and then say, I guess that wasn't the will of God. And some of us don't like this. We're like, well, no, I'll only do the will of God if I know it's the will of God. I'll only take the step of faith if I know. But... You can't take a step of faith knowing what's going to happen because then there's no faith in the step. You know, we have to walk out the will of God in our lives. And so it starts off with point number one, making it a priority. And then number two, being committed to, to, to discipline, to practice, to test the out the will of God and and it's beautiful like we do this in partnership with the renewing of our mind with the transforming of our heart and this is how we know the will of God I mean King David was called a man after God's own heart listen to Acts 13 uh, verse 22 after removing him God raised up David their king he testified about him I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my heart, who will accomplish everything I want him to do. So many people talk about King David and they say, how can he be a man after God's own heart when he was a murderer, he was an adulterer, among many other things. And you know, I've heard people say this and that about him, but it's right here in Acts 13. We're told explicitly what it is that made him a man after God's own heart, it was that he would accomplish the will of God. He was dedicated to accomplishing what God wanted to ha happen. And so we can also become these kind of people by daily practicing, by daily testing, by daily disciplining what is the will of God in our lives. And finally, the uh, will of God needs to define us. It needs to identify us. Matthew 12 verse 50 says, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. I mean, your identity is based on your name. It's based on like how we address you, what we call you. And our name is given to us by our family. And so here Jesus is saying, you are my brother. You are my sister. You, you bear my name. You have my family name if you do the will of the Father. And so this is um, in part and part of the first two points. You know, as I prioritize, as I practice, then I have to identify it. I have to see this as being uh, what defines me, what determines my nature, what identifies me to other people. It's this, it's the pursuit of God's will. 
not just in my life, but in the will of, uh, in, in the lives of all those around me. And the Bible says clearly that God's will is that none should perish. And so this is a, a prime pursuit. It really is. And John 1, 12 to 13 says, But to all who have received him, those who believe in his name, he has given the right to become God's children, children not born by human parents or by human desire or a husband's decision, but by God. This reinforces what we've been saying. My identity is given to me by God. Like God writes a new name on my heart. He, he gives me a, a new birth. He gives me a new life. He, gives me, he calls me a new creation. If, let's not skip the first part of that verse, if we receive him. Now this idea of receiving Christ has been, um, what's a nice way of saying this? It's been hijacked. It's been rendered simply a prayer. It's been rendered simply something you do at the end of a message or when you're touched, when you hear something that moves you and you close your eyes and you pray and you receive Jesus. Now, I say it's been hijacked because it's become that and only that. Of course, prayer is important. Of course, being moved by a message, there's nothing wrong with that. Of course, being brought to a, a moment of saying, okay, Jesus, I'm, I'm going to follow you. I'm, I want you in my life. That's beautiful. Those are beautiful things. And so I don't um, disdain any of those things. But this word receive, is, is, it's lambano. And that means to take up and carry. It means to associate with the burden and and just in practical daily application it means that if i see something to be carried and i go over and i carry it i am lambonoing it I, i'm i'm taking that weight on myself or or put it this way if i see a um you know someone carrying their bags and and they're struggling whether it's in the airport at the grocery store and i go over and i say hey can i can I take that for you? That's lambono. That's what this means. And so John tells us if we receive him, if we lambono him, if we take this burden, if we take this weight, if we take, as Jesus himself said, if we take this yoke, then, then we receive the right to be called children of God. Then we receive the right to pursue the will of the Father. And so this um, idea of, of carrying the weight, it also has another idea that's beautiful. It has this notion of associating with. And so the word is used also when I associate, when I identify, when I, when I use like the, the, the practice that I'm doing as an, an identification marker of my heart. When I basically say, this is what's going to define me. This is what's going to shape me. This is what's going to form me. This is what's going to transform me. This is what's going to renew me. Like when I give myself to this, when I say this is my food, when I say this is my life, when I say this is how I want to be known, then Jesus looks at me and he says, yes, there, there is my brother. There is my sister. There is my son. And anyone who does the will of my Father will enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no more of a meaningful relationship than this. There's no more of a greater pursuit and a use of our time than this. And that's why this is in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's why I believe God wants us today more than ever to pursue his will and to engage in a meaningful relationship with him and to engage in meaningful relationships with those around us that we could also accomplish his will in their lives and then show them, teach them how to do the same. God bless you. Love you guys. And I can't wait to see you next weekend singing, worshiping uh, God together. Until then, bye for now.